Hello, everyone, and good afternoon and welcome. Uh, today, as people start to trickle in, we're just going to start off with our, uh, our PropTech series trailer as uh, people get loaded into the webinar. Having tools that allow you to better understand um, your, your operations and make more data-driven decisions will give companies an edge. If you want to make, if you want to make a bigger impact, then, then, then we're going to go and understand people's behavior. If the tool works and it enables you to do your job more efficiently, it will get adopted. With so many people being inundated by technology and information, you know, what wave do you jump on? I think it's really important that, that we, as an industry, uh, open up and be much more collaborative about the solutions that we apply. Now is the time to create better, build better, and be better. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Richard Joy, Executive Director of ULI Toronto. And I'm pleased to welcome you to today's session, The Business of Placemaking. Today, we'll be exploring how real estate and development professionals are elevating place as a foundation of city building. We are lucky to be joined by an expert panel who will help us understand how placemaking is taking on uh, a marketing and economic development role by activating spaces well in advance of their permanent use, even shaping their future. As a Toronto-based organization, we acknowledge that the land we are meeting on virtually is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. We acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. We are all treaty people. Many of us have come here as settlers, immigrants, and newcomers in this generation and generations past. ULI stands in solidarity with Indigenous communities demanding action and accountability for the ongoing le le legacy of the residential school system. We'd also like to acknowledge and honor those who've come here involuntarily, particularly those who are descended from those brought here through enslavement. To better understand the meaning behind this land acknowledgement, we recommend three programs that we have uploaded to YouTube. These links are available in the chat. 13,000 years of Indigenous history in the GTA and why it matters to planning and development, whose land and whose law, and more recently, Indigenous Toronto, the stories our city paved over. And I'm realizing not in my script, but is a program from just last week that uh, we'll also put in um, to the web and, uh, chat for you to listen to regarding um, the uh, black history of the city of Toronto, especially in the pre-abolition and abolition period of the last century. A few housekeeping items before we go, everyone will be automatically muted throughout the session to avoid audio interference. Closed captioning is available for the session. You can access it via the button along the bottom of the Zoom platform. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A function or to upvote questions of our audience by pressing the thumbs up button. This is a recorded session. The recording will be sent to you after the session. If you wanna take the conversation online, please tag us with the handle at ULI Toronto or with the hashtag ask great questions. Today's event and all other ULI program would not be possible without the support of our annual sponsors. And I'd like to say a major thank you to all of them for that support. Now more than ever, ULI relies on the support of these sponsors who enable us to put on the quality program we do to drive our mission to shape the future of the built environment for transformative impact in communities worldwide. To all of them, we say thank you. And now to introduce our program, it is my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Marcelo Cabela. Um, Marcelo is a, an award-winning placemaker, experienced engineer, marketing, and producer, called a cultural guru by the Toronto Star and someone who makes dreams a reality by Woody Harrelson. 
He has led or be part of some of the most renowned and successful re venue, lifestyle, entertainment, and culture programming over the last 15 years. He is also a go-to contributor for various national media outlets and has been part of the creative economy policies exercises with three levels of government. Finally, he has worked with several leading international real estate developers on placemaking plans and in the interim and permanent in the interim and permanent stage. Ultimately, he is a leading advocate for the benefits of lifestyle, placemaking, and the experience economy. Marcelo, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Richard, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, to help us unpack, explore, and understand the, the business of placemaking, we're joined today by leaders uh, coming from a variety of industry perspectives. We'll be adding the bios into the chat. Joining us today are Parvati Namporthri, the manager of urban design, the city of Markham, Nick Iotso, president and founder of the Ancillary Agency, Oliver Geddes from Rendezvous, and also the owner of The Fifth, Matt Rubinoff, the founder of Stacked, Cheryl Blackman, the interim general manager, economic development and culture, city of Toronto, and Joe Sellers, the project lead for Artworks TO, Toronto's Year of Public Art 2021. With that, let's move right into our discussion. So what do we want to give you today? Well, the moonshot, as Jamie Bennett said last week at the Creative Placemaking webinar, we want you to imagine that tomorrow can be different. We wanna give you the confidence that multidimensional and sensory lifestyle offerings within a placemaking plan can deliver definitive ROI through the proof of concepts that you will hear about today. We wanna to give you the courage to actually execute groundbreaking placemaking plans at both the interim and permanent stages. We wanna give you the high level know-how and intelligence in terms of how the process should really work. That is, when should placemaking be thought of as part of the overall planning process and who should be at the table? We want to give you a clear understanding that placemaking is so much more than delivering just one type of offering. It's about creating multidimensional and sensory experiences and amenities. This is what the public wants, and guess what? They're willing to pay for it. And finally, the respect for placemaking as a practice. As one person once told me in this business, if you need a plumber, you go hire a plumber. That's the same for placemaking. There are specific experts and practitioners who do this for a living, and should, should be brought to the table early and often. So here's some background as a level set before we get started. Well, placemaking as a practice or term has been around for years. The infamous Jane Jacobs is someone that was a proponent of its benefits. For myself, placemaking was clearly what we were doing in the early days of the Drake Hotel when it started in 2004. That is creating multiple experiences in one visit. I was then enthused to hear about the work that Artscape was doing around the idea of creative placemaking in 2006. That said, over the last 15 years, the very idea of what placemaking was has confused people. There were so many different types of placemaking. There was strategic placemaking, tactical, standard, creative, and well, the list goes on. Myself and my peers would present to developers, venues, brands, and government, and would often be met with narratives like, do we really need to do this? And this sounds great, but do you have a proof of concept? And well, to be frank, looking back, we misstepped in terms of really asking them for a large investment for a dream type moonshot versus really pitching them on pilots. Hence, my background here, the Unilever Soap Factory uh, was one that kind of got away, but we'll see what happens uh, in the future with that. And that said, I, I speak not only for my practitioners that I know in Canada, but internationally as well for those who took the step to dip their toe via some in initial placemaking ideation. And well, I, I have to tell you that there's some pretty transformative plans that are still sitting on developers' de desks as we speak. It's not really like throwing anyone, any, uh, throwing anyone under the bus comment, it's, it's, it's reality, but like looking back, we as practitioners need to take some responsibility for that. So really what was missing? Well, we didn't really give them the courage in order to move forward with some of these ideas. We didn't give them the proof of concepts, the real business case to go into their boss's offices and say, Jim, Sally, Juanita, we need to do this. And here are the reasons why. So what's thrilling today, as you will hear, is that, ta-da, well, these proof of concepts have arrived. The success stories are documented. 
the ROI from an economic development and benefits perspective are there. So very quickly, what does the research say? Well, people are looking for experiences in all aspects of lifestyle. That is arts and culture, but also food and beverage, discovery, play, connection, and wellness. They're looking for a destination that can be a one-stop shop that can deliver all these amenities. They're looking for authentic, memorable experiences as a way to learn and discover more about themselves and others and the world around them. And they want ever-changing moments that are more, and they're more curious as ever. People are not looking for black boxes to live or work in. They want places to be fulfilled with life and experiences. So really, what is the opportunity? The question that we need to ask ourselves today is how can places where people live, work, play, and travel offer multi-dimension lifestyle amenities and curate experiences that give no reason for anyone to wanna to leave and every reason to wanna to stay? How can places be triggers for happiness, wellness, balance, and fulfillment in all that we do? Well, that's the preamble. Now let's begin with the discussion with our esteemed panelists. Cheryl Blackman from the city of Toronto. In Jennifer Wade's November article entitled, Why We Need to Invest in Transformative Placemaking, she says, quote, there is an urgency and opportunity for local and regional leaders to embrace and advance place-led development that produces better economic outcomes for more people in more places. Cheryl, you are someone that has had various senior leadership roles at the likes of the ROM, leading audience development and visitor experience efforts, and now you are the interim general manager of economic development and culture at the city of Toronto. You're clearly someone that has seen the benefits of transformative place making, creating destinations where there are multiple offerings. So maybe you can start off our conversation and our discussion and, and touch on the six guiding principles of place making that you feel are important when embarking on establishing a plan. So good afternoon, Marcelo, and good afternoon to our esteemed panel. Um, I just wanna thank you very much for having me here today. And also just for also acknowledging the African ancestral acknowledgement as part of the welcome. It is a rare opportunity for me to hear that uh, in such a, a great space. And I'm really grateful for that. I just wanna remind everybody what economic development and culture does at the city of Toronto. In fact, uh, we are very focused on making sure that Toronto is a place where business and culture thrive. So conversations about placemaking um, you know, this is an, a very appropriate space for us to be in. And as we think about recovering from COVID-19, I also want to remind folks that at Economic Development and Culture, we are thinking about economic recovery and the strategies that will help us reopen businesses, anti-racism and inclusion, workforce and talent development, art and culture. And all of this is important as we think about those guiding principles, Marcelo. Um, so the six guiding principles, in fact, are recirculating resident income locally at a higher rate, is the first one. The second one is reusing vacant and underutilized space, buildings and infrastructure. The third is creating jobs in construction, local businesses and cultural activities. The fourth is expanding entrepreneurial ranks of artists and designers. The fifth is training the next generation and cultural workers. And the sixth is attracting and retaining non-arts related businesses and skills. So coming out of the pandemic, it's critically important that we have programs like Artworks TO that my colleague Joe Sellers will be speaking about, where we use and frame our work around diversity, equity, and inclusion with 85% of Artworks TO funding going to equity deserving led themed arts projects, including a focus on indigenous placemaking and addressing anti-black racism. So I, I would say to you that, you know, part of our effort and thinking about these guidelines is making sure that we address the disproportionate impacts that COVID-19 has had on communities of equity deserving people, and in particular on the arts and culture sector. It's essential that we return the vibrancy of the city of Toronto, and we do this through a lens that is focused on economic recovery coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, well, thank you for that. And, you know, a lot of things to, um, you know, unpack and come back to you on. Um, we're now gonna move to, um, Parvati, um, who is from the city of Markham, and you as the, as the manager of, of urban design uh, for the city of Markham, um, you know, in, in our discussions uh, and within the, uh, the Destination Markham's vision, it states, quote, together with its stakeholders in the community, Markham will co-create and promote distinctive experiences for residents and visitors 
and grow opportunities for businesses and talent to thrive in the 21st century. So could you potentially share some recent success placemaking examples like within this experience? And, and that is through, I gather, multiple public and private sector partners. What were some of the economic development results? Thank you, Marcelo, and good afternoon to you and the panelists and the audience here. And thank you to ULI for um, engaging me in this panel. Um, last week, there was a very interesting event um, that ULI hosted on placemaking. And Tim Jones discussed how creating successful places is an intentional process using design, engagement, and collaboration. We do this every day at the city of Markham through the urban design team um, in, in the review of uh, development projects and working with our development industry partners, stakeholders, and the broader community. We help sh shape the city's bill form and public realm and hopefully everything in between. And this really is aimed to create quality places that people want to live, work, play, and learn in. But today I want to talk about two distinct ways in which Markham supports temporary and creative placemaking in Markham. And the first is by leading. And one of the best examples for this is Markham's public art program. Uh, the city's Department of Economic Development, Culture and Entrepreneurship installed a temporary work of art called Double Gazebo. Uh, it was uh, designed by um, a creative artist collective called uh, Native Art Department International. And it's located in front of our Valley Art Gallery at the, at the um, sort of the termination of Main Street Unionville in Markham and it creates a very distinct, unique experience for residents and visitors. And since it's, in, it's installation in June, and it's going to be there till November, uh, we've had hundreds of visitors, and I'm sure the visitors have definitely contributed to more traffic on main, for Main Street businesses. The second way in which Markham supports creative and temporary placemaking is as a regulator. You know, we enable initiatives by businesses and community groups, and I would like to highlight two examples of this. Um, the first one is the Pride of Canada um, carousel. That's actually the picture behind me today. And it's implemented by Remington Group and was created by Canadian sculptor Patrick Amiot. It's a landmark and a very playful attraction in downtown Markham. And the city was very supportive of this temporary installation back in 2016. It has become a, a fixture in downtown and has att attracted much attention from the residents, visitors, and media and help promote Markham Center as a city's evolving downtown even before key developments came into place and opened their doors. Now, the second example I would like to uh, point out is the, uh, the city's response to COVID-19 and in support of expanded patios um, as a response to COVID-19. So as you know, in, as in every city around the world, Markham's businesses, artists, and entrepreneurs struggled in the wake of restrictions uh, after COVID-19, and Markham implemented a temporary use zoning bylaw in 2020, and provides a no-fee simplified process for businesses to temporarily work outdoors to keep their staff and patrons safe and support local economy. And today, the city has helped create over 60 such patios. So I believe such flexible policies and processes that respond to evolving urban environments, community needs, disruptive technology or changing economic trends are key for any city to be regarded as a desirable and welcoming place to live, work, play, and do business. That's great. Thank you for that. And obviously, um, you know, the policy work that you've done uh, is definitely delivering results. Uh, we look forward to further uh, discussions on that, hopefully later on. Um, our next guest, Nikki Oso, uh, a colleague uh, and someone that's uh, very entrepreneurial. Um, uh, he's now started the ancillary agency. So Nick, you've been in the retail placemaking and brand activation industry for many years, leading teams at Rogers, Cadillac Fairview and Oxford Properties. And you know, you've recently, you know, as mentioned, started this new, new agency. So how do you think the climate is different in terms of the public yearning for these, you know, more multi-dimensional experiences, you know, triggering brands, commercial leasing companies and real estate developers to, to really think on, on, you know what, like creating these memorable sensory moments um, can actually trigger emotional connections uh, to want to come back to, to want to buy, you know, um, um, you know, a, a specific uh, condo or, um, you know, or, or live in that, uh, live and work in that area. And so, you know, within, you know, that answer, I mean, where, what are you seeing kind of year over year in terms of the investment of these 
um, uh, of these brands, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, getting involved in these activations. Right. Um, I, I, thank you very much for, for the invitation. Uh, I, I'll, I'll answer my, your question in a perspective of the, the, the COVID world that we're living in and, and, and the, uh, the moving into a reopening of the economy. Uh, what we started to see, and, and, and things are changing week by week, but as we started to see late spring, early summer with the vaccination rates coming up, uh, COVID cases coming down, we really saw the public's yearning for a lot of these new experiences. They've been cooped up inside for a year and a half. A lot of them haven't seen friends and family. Um, there's a fatigue of being on Zoom uh, no pun intended, we are on a Zoom webinar. Um, there was this yearning to get out and experience things with friends, with families, and, 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 and move into that demand and into that, into that world. So the demand from the public was very strong late spring, early summer. Two steps behind them were the brands ready to activate to meet those demands. And it was a wait and see approach by a lot of these companies, entertainment companies, brand activations, pop-ups, uh, those experiences. And it's because they had this, you know, somebody on one shoulder saying, let's go, let's go, let's go. Um, the other person on their other shoulder saying, let's hold back a little bit. And talking with a lot of the brands and the agencies, there seemed to have been this desire to really start moving forward end of Q3 going into Q4. So this fall, um, going into the Christmas holiday season, what was holding them back in our discussions with a lot of the agencies and brands were their lawyers and their insurance companies. And so, you know, public's ready to go. Brands are ready to meet that demand with a couple months of, of lag time. And, and their insurance companies and their lawyers were saying, whoa, 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 let's hold back. Let's make sure that we've got enough precautions in place. And so for a lot of the brands that we're talking with in agencies, even going into spring and summer of 2022, um, they're still working with protocols of social distancing, maximizing the outdoor experiences, everything leading into those experiences based on how we've been operating for the last year and a half. That being said, the commercial real estate companies in the world out there are really seeing the benefits of these activations. Um, set aside the financial benefits, um, rent, uh, rev share, advertising fees. Um, these activations, experiential entertainment really provide an intrinsic benefit for the commercial real estate world. One, it helps to drive traffic. And, and for a lot of the bre uh, bricks and mortar type of, of, of asset classes, driving footfall. Um, but in uh, other ways, it's driving social media traffic as well. Um, and then there's this elevated guest experience. Again, people want to welcome people back into a shopping center, back into an office. Those who are traveling again, welcome them back into a, a hotel and hospitality world. So uh, there's been some really great examples over the last year and a half on those experiences. Um, some of your sponsors that you all I just placed on the front slides as we, we, we came on board. A lot of them were key in activating over the last year and a half. We saw drive-in movie theaters. We saw a Dr. Seuss exhibit, which was sold out in the early months of 2020. Um, you've got Van Gogh. You have the uh, Monet ex exhibit that's going on at the convention center. Uh, the Harry Potter pop-up that was done out in Pickering. All huge successes. And so in the retail world, you know, they're really trying to help drive this traffic back to bricks and mortar. Um, COVID has really elevated that online shopping, uh, and we really want to get people back in in-person visits, and, and we know that that will help shift that spend back to bricks and mortar. Uh, they also help to fill vacancy, and every asset class is dealing with an enhanced vacancy. I think we're here in the Toronto chapter. We have been blessed with some of the lowest vacancy rates in all of North America, and the numbers are, are elevating. So a lot of these uh, activations, pop-ups, uh, entertainment uses help to fill some of those vacancies, turn lights on, animate the spaces, um, and also helps extend dwell time on the retail world. We all know the longer somebody stays in an asset, the more they will spend. Um, so extending that dwell time, bringing in a lot of traffic. Um, and in the office world right now, there's a big push to get people back into a physical office space. If it's not five days a week, it's two or three days a week. 
And, you know, office workers have been at home for up to 18 months now. Some of them have not even stepped foot in their old offices. I, I know I had to go pick up old gym clothes, my winter boots. And I think I had still had a few Christmas gifts left over from last year. Um, so, you know, what is going to entice people back in? Um, we need to get um, some of those experiences that are different than from working from home. So, um, you know, are there retail markets going on? Are landlords sponsoring yoga sessions and run clubs, entertainment activations in the office portfolio, free sampling, live music, anything to help generate that excitement to go back to the office. Um, and then again, these activations are not limited to retail and office. Uh, I've worked with hotel clients. We've worked with residential clients, um, even industrial. We've been able to animate some of those spaces. So, I, I mean, the overall investment is fairly small. A lot of the brands and entertainment companies are shouldering a lot of the capital. Um, but that small investment in pop-up retail, experiential entertainment, sponsorship, digital static media really helps to meet that objective of real estate owner. One, again, drive traffic, elevated guest experience. And at the end of the day, ultimately, it's, it's driving new revenue streams. That's great, Nick. Thanks so much for that. Um, we'll come back to a lot of those things. We'll now yeah. pivot to uh, Oliver Geddes uh, from Rendezvous, um, which has been a story this summer for sure. So Oliver, you're obviously uh, an industrious, resourceful business person that put together this attractive beer garden uh, in 2020 that said in 2021, you know, you clearly pivoted to a whole other level of, of lifestyle placemaking and you and your team have created this this destination that Toronto really hasn't seen before, or as, as Blog Teal calls it, uh, quote, Toronto's most epic outdoor patio ever, no pressure. Um, so what was it that really kind of drove you to, to need to pivot so boldly in 2021? And what are some of the positive results that you've seen? Uh, thanks for that, Marcello. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, last year, to use the most overused word on earth, my pivot was uh, a parking lot that was next to and abutted uh, the fifth, which is uh, an entertainment complex in downtown Toronto. And um, I uh, have, have a seat on the downtown B West BIA and working with them was able to uh, uh, get in touch with the city and get permission to use this 30,000 square foot parking lot that the city of Toronto had purchased uh, about 18 months prior and uh, had put a fence around it and uh, frankly had abandoned it uh, with it becoming a, a park in the future. Um, we had very little time in 2020 to put the whole thing together. And essentially we had uh, 80 picnic tables that were all socially distanced. And we had what amounted to uh, a beer garden in a parking lot. And there was always this sort of element, this third dimension that was missing in the space. Uh, having uh, then get shut down again last fall and, and too much time on our hands as to what to do in 2021, um, an idea was born when the uh, mayor had announced that 2021 would be the year of the arts. And so we thought, what can we do? How can we use art as a vehicle to sort of transform this space, elevate this space, create um, a, 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 almost like a three-dimensional environment that hadn't been done before. And so uh, in the early spring, we got to work on this sort of bold idea of creating this canvas or taking this canvas and creating what we believe to be one of the largest murals in the country and have the, so the, the, the parking lot surface, as you can see behind me is painted, but it also runs up a 15,000 square foot wall on the west side of the parking lot. And so uh, we had a bunch of very uh, serendipitous uh, events occur and it was a very um, uh, uh, neat and uh, nice uh, venture between the private sector sponsors, the BIA and the city of Toronto that sort of all bought in to this idea and this concept that this patio could bring uh, uh, optimism and hope and color. There's a great drone shot if you go to our website, rendezvous.ca, um, where from above, you know, so much of our landscape in downtown Toronto is gray. And this pop of color 
uh, really does transform um, the block. It transforms the area. You cannot help but stop if you're walking by and take that picture. And it's, it's, it's succeeded beyond, I think, all of our, our wildest dreams insofar as it sort of checked all of the boxes that one of my uh, peers spoke of earlier. And it has driven so much traffic and created what has lacked so much in not only downtown Toronto, but I think most urban centers, which is vibrancy. So vibrancy is created by bars and restaurants and theater and galleries and concerts and tourism and conventions, all of the things that COVID took from us. And we wanted this project to be bigger than two on-premise uh, people having a patio. We really wanted this project to be sort of a, a gift to the city that helps uh, with the rebirth and the bringing back of our downtown, which again, got gutted, um, uh, I would suggest worse than perhaps anywhere in the city. I mean, this is where we're located is the entertainment district of Toronto. And candidly, uh, over the last 18 months, there have been months where it felt like a ghost town. And there was a very sort of depressing feeling in the air and so we, again, decided to use art as a vehicle to transform this space, to bring back the traffic, to bring back vibrancy, and again, bring uh, a sense of rebirth and hope back into our city. Great, Oliver, thank you for that. Um, uh, we're gonna circle back to a bunch of things that you've talked about. Um, our next guest is Matt Rubinoff, uh, the founder of Stack Market. And uh, Matt, you know, you are, are currently running, uh, you know, one of or, or the foremost uh, multicultural lifestyle placemaking hubs that Toronto has probably ever seen uh, and consistently um, offering multiple experiences in one visit. So maybe you could talk a little bit about kind of the, the journey to get here and maybe share some of the, the key lessons that you've learned to date and, and how you're implementing them. Sure, sir. Uh, thanks for having me and thanks everybody for attending. Um, with Stack, we built a, an interesting ecosystem. Um, we generate a, a sense of discovery for visitors. So every time everyone's coming, um, you know, it's ever changing, ever evolving space. And so I don't mean with that, that, you know, you're gonna necessarily stumble across something different um, in a different corner of the site when you come. It's more about um, we're consistently rotating different experiences. Um, throughout the site. And so with that, we're providing multiple touch points, what we believe are authentic ones um, for brands to engage with these visitors. Um, as for the journey and getting there, uh, it wasn't always an easy conversation um, with brands in early days. You know, for us, authentic engagement means um, typically it's limited to no branding, probably not sampling ever involved, um, a lot more restrictions than these brands are typically used to dealing with. Um, we put a lot of effort into the curation of the space. And so that means saying no a lot to, to certain opportunities. Um, and that makes it difficult. If you're in a space for a, a short amount of time, um, it's tough to say no all the time. And, uh, but it's, it's essential basically to the growth um, and in building our community. So, you know, luckily in a short amount of time uh, in just a couple of years, we've been able to, uh, to, to accomplish what we set out to do with it. And so we're seeing some great results from that, which has been great. Um, and I'm happy to say from that, the conversations have been much easier now with brands uh, than when we started and uh, just had this kind of rendering and envision of what we were trying to do. Um, I know Marzoli will probably want me to dive into uh, <laughs> some examples uh, of that. I'll give you an easy one, um, which would be the beer brand uh, that we have on site. Uh, Belgian Moon is the brand. Um, so that's, they've been with us since we opened. And, uh, you know, as you go through this process of kind of uh, engaging with these brands, um, before even the discussion probably begins, you, you need to first think about uh, a couple of things and what you're trying to achieve. So not all brands may align to your brand with it. Um, so you need to also figure out what you'd like to see from them on site. So 
the first part uh, ends up kind of shortlisting a lot of the, the, the brands that you're speaking with because you need to make sure that it's the right fit. More importantly, I would say is, is the what. And for us, we felt it was really important to have manufacturing on site and the manufacturing component was going to be really key. Um, this helps with the storytelling. This is, you know, we're making a big global brand feel much smaller. Um, they're brewing seasonal variants on site. It's local. Um, and we're offering beers that are unique to this location specifically. Um, so right there, you've already accomplished quite a lot. Um, it's a draw for consumers. You've created a unique offering. It's, it's something local and it can't be found anywhere else. Um, following that, what we do is we integrate that brand throughout the rest of the site. So, you know, we take that narrative of the brand and it naturally kind of weaves its way through the ecosystem of Stack. So um, you're getting integrated into events and other food partners and the tenants that we have on site. So now you've really helped them, you know, you've helped provide the brand with a high level of engagement with consumers and something that can't be replicated elsewhere. Um, so you've provided multiple opportunities for them to engage with the stack community as well. So as a result from this, um, we provided them access, uh, to a pretty wide demographic of consumers. Um, and it's now it's the, or always, I guess, has been the number one category that's consumed on site. And for them, they're seeing growth in a category that's been naturally declining over uh, for years, which would be the beer category. Um, so that kind of comes as a result of it. That's great, Matt. Thank you for that. And thank you for that specific example. Always good to kind of, you know, just just hear, hear the specifics. Um, our, our final panelist uh, is Joe Sellers, who's the, uh, the lead for Artworks TO, or Year of Public Art. And, and we definitely wanted to include him um, and kind of put him last just because it is coming up um, at the end of September, I guess. Um, so obviously Joe is um, as the lead uh, of this uh, new uh, creative venture, you and your team, you know, you've had the benefit of, of seeing and learning from other lifestyle and creative placemaking examples in the city and, um, you know, uh, a program, you're about to launch a program that's really the city has never seen before. So what are the things that you and your team have considered as you've put your plan in place and, and to that end, like how will this potentially be different um, from the offerings or amenities Toronto audiences are used to when they usually experience art? And will you be piloting new place making experiences early and, and potentially see if they work, um, which would then inform kind of what you would do later, you know, it, within, the, within the year that you're doing the year of public art? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Marcelo, and uh, happy to be here. Good to be here. Honored to be here with, with uh, amongst this panel and look at all those attendees. So thanks, uh, thanks for having me. But uh, and also recognition to um, folks like Oliver and, and Matt. You know, doing making environments like that that we're trying to replicate as part of Artworks TO. These are these are environments that are really really important for the city of Toronto. But to give a little bit of context too for Artworks TO and Toronto's Year of Public Art, if you don't mind, and forgive me if this sales sounds like a sales pitch. It's not at all. It just it's helpful to uh, to share where where we come from and where we're at right now, and that's basically that uh, there was a ten year public art strategy created, and Artworks TO is the public facing launch of that ten year public art strategy. So this was all sort of kicked off in the mayor's uh, mayor Tory's twenty eighteen election campaign to say let's do a year of public art. I think we all looked at each other and said how the heck do we do this, and then we had the strategy, and we all decided that this is this is important for the city, and uh, and the mayor has held it very close to uh, his heart, and. Uh, uh, and he's, he's feels very strongly about it. So as part of Artworks TO, yes, it was supposed to launch in January of 2021. We are now delayed until September 22 of this year. Hopefully, fingers crossed, we can stick to that deadline. We are planning in full tilt. Some say, well, what if it gets canceled? What if it doesn't? The option, the only other option is not to do it. And that's not really an option. So we got to push forward like everything else we do. I'm sure I can see smiles on the, on the panels here saying, it's got to keep pushing forward and, and uh, delay if we, we got to, but otherwise there's a whole lineup of things. And to your point, Marcelo, I think, you know, Cheryl teed it up for me from a corporate and from a div divisional standpoint, but to boil it down to the, the year of public art and the 10 year public art strategy, uh, create creativity community everywhere is really what we're going for. Uh, and I think that's very telling and, and related and, uh, and resonates with the discussion for today. So, 
the, we are pumping out money to, into artist pockets. City, the city, you know, the, the, the council has given us a couple of dollars, but we are fundraising like crazy in order to match those dollars in order to push money out into artist pockets because it creates business. Talking about how um, artists and experience convert into intrinsic value that create hundreds of moments where people come and enjoy something and then go out and buy an ice cream cone at that local business or go buy a beer at that local joint or whatever it is. But it's, it's, it keeps giving and giving and giving as opposed to having, let's say, um, a concert or something, which is sort of a one, th one time thing. But we, we do have very specific things that align really well. So using, again, rendezvous and stacked as an example, we're trying to create uh, hubs around the city. Um, we also have a focus on trying to get outside the core and to create a little bit more equity across across the city because a majority of the public art, 70% of the public artwork is downtown with 70% of the population outside the core. So we, we intend to stand up um, uh, community hubs uh, in seven places, four mains and three pop-ups around the city. Etobicoke, Union Station, uh, so out in Etobicoke, Cloverdale Commons, Union Station downtown, uh, Downsview up uh, in the north end, and then Scarborough Town Center in the uh, in the east. And these are opportunities where they will be curated by emerging curators using emerging artists to to create environments and to create space that will be open all year round. And the exhibitions will flip, uh, you know, after some months. But they're they're in very public places because we want to really change somewhat of the demographic and the clientele of of public art. Um, and making sure that everyone in Toronto see them, sees themselves reflected as we sort of redefine what public art is in the city of Toronto. So um, with these hubs uh, uh, creates experience and they're multifaceted. We want the, the, you know, one of the main purposes is to actually raise awareness for public art across the city of Toronto. What is it? People have no idea. People have no idea that that particular artwork that they're walking by is actually part of the city collection. Um, and so we're trying to raise awareness for the thousands of pieces, pieces that we have and also raise awareness for public art, internationally acclaimed public art across the city. Mm -hmm. So a couple other things I would mention too is that as part of, we want to make sure that the year of public art just doesn't come and go. So we have things to show for it afterwards. Um, one very important legacy program would be our artists in residence, artists in residence program that we're trying to launch. And we'll, we'll get that up and running over the year of public art but that will help city divisions work with artists to rethink the way they do business. And in some cases, if they're providing a service or they're building, let's say it's uh, solid waste putting in garbage cans in a park, you know, how can that garbage can be better in service? That seems very simple, but uh, as we all know, um, taking simple things and artifying them and, and creating experience by the, uh, with them uh, can really change an environment. And I think um, you need, you need the space and you need the activation. Without the two of them together, I think it's really difficult to, to make a jive and really be successful in what we're talking about here today. Yeah, well, thanks for that, Joe. And, um, you know, we also look forward to the other experiences and amenities and offerings that you're gonna have as, as part of the art, but the legacy program sounds, uh, sounds fantastic. So it is 1243, we wanted to um, um, obviously uh, uh, be respectful to the, uh, what, what could be a near record attendees today. So Richard, maybe over to you for some, uh, some, uh, some audience questions. Sure, thank you. Excuse me. Um, lots of questions and uh, perhaps there'll be some more still. So uh, I'm gonna curate a little bit. I will tend to, to go for the ones at the top uh, of the list, uh, but I might uh, pick a few out for, as well. I'm actually gonna do that right now, just, just to throw a few questions out uh, and, and Marcella, maybe you can help uh, uh, traffic cop uh, who answers, but one of them, uh, the top question here is, uh, what is the role of placemakers in ensuring artists have spaces to live and work as well as necessary arts funding to create art? I think that's come up. In fact, I think one of our very first webinars that we did in the pandemic season with the Artscape, uh, with Artscape and Artscape Foundation was exactly around that, that, uh, that, that question. But a couple other questions I just would also throw out uh, here. Um, one is, um, uh, well, one was related. Uh, so many artists are left to fight for limited public grant dollars, especially for murals and large scale placemaking style art. What do panelists see as a role for the private sector in supporting artists uh, long term rather than one shot need fulfillment? Uh, so that's a, that's a more structural long term question. And then uh, Dina Grazer uh, asks, uh, 
the Why Not Theater and the and CUIK and the Urban Institute uh, are working on building a replicable model to match make vacant spaces with artists for, for rehearsal spaces and other things, I think, as well. Um, are there incentives? Basically, the essence of the question is the, the, the uh, how we could better do what uh, we are seeing here, especially um, with the uh, uh, rendezvous and 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 the stack I think uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong in describing the stack as as a, a what some people are calling meanwhile spaces spaces that uh, are being used to the hilt right now but probably have some longer term uh, uh, purpose like the park uh, at, at, at the fifth for example um, what what are some of the opportunities to better leverage these meanwhile spaces across uh, the greater golden horseshoe? So a few questions in there. Uh, meanwhile, yeah, spaces. Well, yeah, go ahead. Take it. Yeah, over. No, I was gonna. I was gonna say, and and I'm not. I'm trying. I'm not trying to block them. They're all relevant questions, but they're all relevant within the creative placemaking um, practice. I think one of the things that we really wanted to try to do today is is talk about lifestyle placemaking. Talk about that placemaking is involving multiple experiences in one visit. So um, I feel that creative placemaking is something that was addressed last week and, and we can definitely, you know, continue to address it. Are there any specific questions that kind of focus on, you know, our, our, our speakers today as it pertains to, you know, delivering the multiple experiences in one visit? Any questions in terms of how they do it, why they do it, their challenges? Uh, I'm just scanning through here, but I think my questions, the questions sure, I yeah. if you wanted, if you just uh, have want to, to do with the economics uh, yeah. more broadly, well, Marcella. Okay, so just if you could just pose one specific question, because um, there are a lot of them. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll pick on uh, Joe and Cheryl from the city, uh, and perhaps uh, Parvati, you could also jump in on this one. Uh, and it's the idea of, of leveraging the meanwhile spaces as economic opportunities, uh, both for maybe adjacent property owners, but also for uh, the artists' uh, 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 communities in uh, in your jurisdictions. Maybe Cheryl and Joe, if to start off with the uh, uh, meanwhile place question. Yeah, thanks a lot for that question, Richard. I think you know certainly through the um, COVID nineteen pandemic, we've seen downtowns become, as, as Oliver spoke about earlier, you know, uh, ghost towns, and we want to kind of deepen these senses of belonging, because I think, you know, we want there to be a correlation between feeling like you belong and connection to the city. And, and that, that brings that vibrancy back. And certainly through programs like Artworks Co, we're going to see artworks go into neighborhoods and really um, work in partnership with business owners in particular to activate those empty storefronts. And I'll, I'll throw to Joe to build some texture around that. Yeah, I think I might just take this minute. Thanks, Cheryl. I think I might just take a second here to um, to talk about one of the programs we are running called um, Out of the Show Love TO program, which is a sort of a larger inspirational comeback campaign after COVID uh, that will launch September 14th. Uh, there's a couple of programs in there, but one in particular is called No Vacancy. So although maybe not long-term solution, there are short-term short solutions for artists and, uh, and space uh, as we start to activate uh, and this is this is nothing new. Many cities are doing this, where we're activating uh, vacant storefronts uh, in, on our main streets in order to help welcome people back to their main streets and, and help them, uh, you know, spend money uh, in their neighborhoods. Uh, but as part of that, and, and there's there's some front runners here, people like Akin Collective, who are who actually, uh, which is their business in taking empty space and converting it to studio space for artists. So working with them also as they create a database of all this available space that's cost affordable um, to spit out there for artists to, uh, to tap into. As I mentioned though, not sustainable, not long-term, but at least in the interim while we get our heads on, uh, this is something that, uh, that is a good fix. And the, you know, there, it provides space for the artists, it provides activation and art uh, and experience for passer buyers in the, on those main streets. Parvati? I'm going to add a bit of a planning perspective to this conversation. And um, a lot of times as, uh, as a regulatory agency, what we want to focus in on being flexible in the face of these disruptions. So COVID-19 is a prime example. And I took the example of patios. I'm not going to linger on that, but uh, the, the key um, aspect of that program and passing that temporary bylaw was really to look at the way people use parking. So as you know, in, in Markham, most of our retail is actually placed in 
retail plazas instead of street oriented retail. So you, we see in Toronto all over the place, the patios are expanded onto the street. We have close lanes to traffic and that provides us an opportunity to improve um, not only the local economy, but also create these experiences, these places where people can go and socialize. And Nick mentioned that earlier, people are tired of sitting at home and you want to step out. And the way we looked at it was to say, oh, you know, the, the capacity of these um, retail spaces have diminished significantly. Do we really need that many parking spaces? And is there an opportunity to convert them into patios, these active spaces? So what suddenly, you know, back in the day was these gray zones in the city, um, these large parking lots, they have now become active spaces with patios and not just F&B, but also um, artists and makers uh, opening up their shops onto these um, spaces. So I would say short and long-term cities should consider permissive policies um, and programs where uh, working and collaborating with development industry and landowners where there, there are these vacant spaces, how can we on a temporary basis and maybe on even a long-term basis uh, be nimble and be flexible to allow for innovation to happen, allow for creative uses to happen. And this takes a lot of, um, you know, from a regulatory side, uh, being nimble from our side, but also a lot of co collaboration and reaching out to the community to create such opportunities. Yeah, and a, and a quick build on that. I mean, the, my, my background is the Unilever Soap Factory um, and the powers that be were considering uh, using that factory and using the space as, as an interim use. Uh, so put aside the full double page uh, spread ads in the Globe and Mail or Toronto Star, why not use the physical space uh, as an experiential marketing play to develop emotional connections with potential tenants and purveyors of lifestyle um, so the very essence of, you know, as, as developers, um, as, as people look at taking over spaces and something else is to come, um, interim use has profound benefits um, as it pertains to ROI um, and, and really providing, you know, it seems to be a narrative providing our space, providing an opportunity for them to work, but it has a profound experiential marketing um, uh, benefits um, that truly, uh, you know, develop emotional connections with your uh, with your potential future end user. Great. And I noticed that the uh, Canadian Urban Institute or somebody uh, on their behalf is uh, flagging uh, mymainstreet.ca, a program that uh, maybe we could put in the in the chat link as well. Just uh, point you at the uh, program that that they're leading that I believe is getting into. Um, uh, this space as well. But I'm wondering if I could just broadly speaking, Nick, uh, Oliver and Matt, I'll, uh, if I could get you to weigh in on this is maybe to maybe closing us out on, on some of the questions. There is a, a theme in the questions around the artist. Um, I think we've, we've definitely in focusing this uh, on the economics. Uh, perhaps we're thinking about uh, the, the, those who, the, who are driving these initiatives, but the artists ultimately are a critical role in placemaking uh, most of the time. And I'm wondering if you might uh, just speak a little bit to your experience and, and Oliver, I'm curious, I mean, you've got an incredible backdrop there. Um, what, what, how you engaged uh, and how you might see in the future structurally us doing a better job of engaging artists in placemaking. Yeah, I mean, I'll talk on a, on a commercial real estate perspective. A lot of the major landlords, again, looking to fill spaces, but also wanting to engage with the art, local artist communities, have invited um, artists, artist collectives to come in uh, to set up galleries, often in for free space, uh, free of charge, uh, again, to get that community engagement. Um, I've worked with uh, an arts collective, this is out in Calgary, uh, and bringing artists together to animate the common spaces of an asset. Um, and, you know, Cadillac Fairview is a good example of uh, creating a, and we talk about um, uh, different types of art, but creating a, a soundstage in, in a studio for recording artists to come in free of charge to use a studio to record musics and podcasts and, and such. So there's an opportunity for the commercial real estate world to engage with the arts community, uh, provide them that free space. It also provides, again, goodwill within the, within the organization. And, and it just, again, elevates that customer experience for those walking through an office building or through a shopping center. Um, and then, you know, there's other brands who want to be associated with it. A, a good 
GTA type of brand is Collective Arts Brewery, who really engage with their artists, not only the artists that are on their beer cans and beer bottles, but then engaging with those artists um, for mural art. Um, you know, Oliver, you've got you great artists doing that big, massive mural uh, who has a relationship with Collective Arts Brewery. And how do we engage with those artists through other experiential type of activities? So private sector can come in working with commercial real estate owners and providing a, a, a platform for artists within the GTA. <clears throat> Yeah, it was in fact actually Collective Arts who we partnered with um, yes. for this this mural, and obviously the artists yes. did just an incredible job. Um, and there is, I think, an abundance of opportunity for both um, municipalities and the private sector to again engage with artists and within that community, and to give them these canvases to convert them into a better place. And you know, we we again what's the ROI not just economically but on sort of that that community connection I I always refer to you know within the first couple of weeks there was a woman um on on our, our patio <clears throat> came up to me and and she had tears in her eyes and she said thank you for doing this I've been sitting in a condo for over a year looking at nothing but bleak grayness and I'm here now I'm watching my soccer team uh, during the Euro Cup and I don't know how you, uh, what the metric is for that. What, what, you know, what's, what's the happiness metric, but it's there and I can speak to it. It is real. And there is a ripple effect that is extremely powerful and it will therefore translate into economic benefit. So hi, Richard and, and Marcelo, just, if I can build on Oliver's point really quick, there is a metrics for that. It's called the Canadian wellness index. Um, something we should all get our head around because, you know, measuring happiness sounds like a kind of a crazy thing to do, but it actually is being measured by researchers. And that belonging that I mentioned earlier, this is exactly where the rubber hits the road. And I love that example. Thanks for sharing that, Oliver. We learned something. Yeah, so okay. I think, uh, is Matt going to just uh, finish oh, off yeah, that? Please, think, yeah, please, thank you. Um, yeah, no, I think it was great. I also, I think all those examples, that one was terrific. Um, you know, hearing reactions like that, I think <clears throat> Nick touched on something interesting um, as this platform, you know, we can provide canvases uh, and everything there. Um, is there the ability to take that beyond um, that as a platform and, and, and offer an extension of that? Um, whether that be through um, the communications, the social, um, you know, events, uh, things that are kind of um, take it a step further. And so that's something that um, I've heard a lot of feedback I would have a lot of value to these artists. The exposure piece is fantastic from obviously uh, from a visual standpoint, typically, but there's a lot of things that we can add to that as well. Um, that has benefits both ways. You know, it's fantastic for the artists um, themselves to see that. And you'll see that benefit as well from the audience um, that's there, who's now able to further engage and understand um, some of that art or something about the artist even further. So um, I thought that was a great point by Nick there. That's great, Thanks, Matt. Matt. So Marcelo, I'm gonna just give it to you for about a 45 second yeah, no, uh, sure. final word, and then we're going to yeah. uh, close out on time. Yeah, very good. Well, thank you so much for all of our panelists. A uh, great conversation. As always with these, uh, they could go on for hours. Uh, you know, we obviously uh, hope uh, that we've inspired uh, a further conversation uh, in your companies, in your groups. I think the, the two things that we want to leave you with is, is, is the confidence that, you know, there is return on investment and there are case studies out there. Um, and, and these are just some of the few. Um, and also, you know, the courage to actually execute these plans that you may have thought about uh, or might be sitting on the side of your desk. Um, you know, we are coming into the golden age of the experience economy. And this idea of, of, of all four, uh, uh, sorts of placemaking, uh, including uh, the lifestyle placemaking, which we, I think, uh, inaugurally coined today, um, is the way of the future. So we look forward to further conversations with you. Um, you know, let's have those conversations early in the planning. And it does take a village to make this magic. And um, let's make it happen. Thank you. Thank you, 
Marcelo, and, and thank you to the entire panel. Uh, we're just at time now, so uh, I think we're going to quickly flip up some upcoming events to point out to you. But I'll just say in closing out, um, this is just by the dint of the amount of people who logged into this event uh, today and the one we had last week as well, um, there's huge appetite for placemaking. And I, you say, uh, Marcelo, we're entering the golden age of experiential um, uh, economy and so forth. Um, I think we're, it feels like we're in early days uh, with a long way to go. And I can just send to you the message that ULI plans to be a big part of that. And we'll be partnering with all of you uh, in, in making that, that golden age happen. So uh, thank you so much uh, to everybody for joining us today. I wish you a very good week and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.